You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again. It is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central. It is time once again for TWIFO. This week in futures, options, the name pretty much says it all. We break down the week that was and indeed still is on the futures options side of the fence. What's going to make it onto the show each week? You got to tune in every week. Last week, we went crazy. We got PTSD in the ags last week with Carly Gunn. I got a feeling we're going to get a little bit of whiplash out there in the energy sector this week. So, again, that's what makes this show so fascinating. You got to tune in every week, listeners, to see what's lighting up the tape. My name, of course, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as from the network upon which so many of you are binging these days. If you like what you hear, throw some stars or a rating or a comment or a like, whatever your platform lets you do. All that stuff does help new people continue to discover the content and clearly there are new people discovering the world of options all the time they need a place to turn help them find a place to twifo and indeed to the rest of the network you already downloaded you already listening to the show you already cost me some bandwidth pay it forward with a little bit of the old likes and all that fun the ratings the reviews and of course if you want even more fun in your life and who doesn't let's say you don't want your broadcast week to end with volatility views tomorrow you want to come back for options oddities you want to get great pro q and a's like we had this week with Jim Carroll, Mr. Vixologist himself, talking all things vol, then theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to learn more. As you go around the horn, see who's joining us on the old CME hot seat today. I am pleased to welcome back our old friend, Mr. Russell Rhodes, holding down the fort at the Kelly School of Business. He's also the author of one or two or half a dozen options and volatility oriented tomes, but we call him around here the once future and now present. He has the paper. So, and now present, Dr. Vicks. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to the show, sir. I have the paper. It's funny. We were joking around about the paper, and I posted a picture of it. And you got you, you just got to love the Twitter or the Xer or whatever we're calling it now. Yeah, Because uh, somebody was shocked and appalled that, that I had to prove that I had finished it. They didn't, they didn't realize it was kind of a joke, but... 
It was a kind of a joke. They have what kind of person is making you <laughs> prove that you got that thing? They obviously have not been listening to the Nobody network. is making me do anything I don't want to do. <laughs> we had your, your best friend in the Futures Options world, Carly Garner, on the show last week. She said horrible things about you, so you have to return the favor this week. We have never met. <laughs> and we I mean, we we exchange messages and stuff. And God knows I've been out to Vegas a few times where she hangs her hat, as you put it. Um, yeah, that, I, I it maybe we're the same person. Because we've never been in the same room. <laughs> there you go. I have never seen the two of you in the same room together. She does tell me whenever you come to Vegas, she does kind of try to dodge you. So maybe there's a little uh, bit of that. I, I've, I've figured that one out already. So every time <laughs> I'm not going to be I'm, I'm, I, I've got to go do something somewhere else. I'm not going to be there, but enjoy yourself. So we yeah, will be fun. moving on, though, into the movers and shakers report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers Report, the portion of the show where we break down everything lighting it up to the light side and to the dark side over there at CME since our last show. And it's another week, listeners, where we are almost exactly evenly split it's kind of another weird one you know for a while there we were seeing very biased markets in one direction or the other a whole bunch of green a whole bunch of red made it difficult to put together a bottom or top five some weeks these days not a challenge at all we got an abundance of riches in both directions so mr rhodes the door is open the floor is yours which way should we begin this week sir door is open let's go light and then dark (laughs) <laughs> yes, that is how the show goes. <laughs> glad to so see you. Light and then dark. Glad to see you're catching on after how many appearances, sir. So how this how this segment works. All right, to the light side we go, listeners, and hopefully you're in the mood for a little bit of energy because we got some for you this week. Except for number five. Number five, those little sectors continue to sneak their way in from the S and P CME listing those E mini S and P sector futures and. Getting some volume on those. No options yet because they're not quite blowing the doors off. But they are starting to light up our movers and shakers, which is interesting. This week, number five to the light side is the communications sector. So intriguing stuff, up 3.94%. And number four, it's all energy the rest of the way, listeners. Number four, we got Brent up a little over four, about 4.13%. Number three, it's Arbob up 5.41%. Again, before you ask about either of those, uh, you know the deal by now. Not a lot of options paper to really parse there, even though Arbob has got a little bit more to speak of. Uh, Number two, one of our old friends, it's WTI up 5.43%. And number one this week is heating oil up 7.49%. 0.59 percent again same deal there not exactly blowing the doors off out there on the heating oil from a volume perspective so we don't usually add it to the rotation but you could see the breadth of the energy lighting up the light side this week pun intended now to the dark side we go this is number five off to the metals we go it is platinum off a little over two about 2.05 percent number four right behind it still hanging out in the metals it is silver off 2.65 percent Number three, it is palladium off a little over 4, 4.02% to be precise. Number two, one of our frequent offenders, it is back. We haven't seen it in a while, listeners. It is lumber off 4.77%. It was number three last week off a little over 5%. So that's two weeks in a row now we've seen lumber back. I was starting to wonder whether we needed to take it off our frequent offenders list because it just wasn't making the list much anymore the last few months. But here it is back two weeks in a row. I guess dead trees back on the menu, listeners, or at least from a vol perspective. And then number one to the dark side this week, one of our other frequent offenders. It is Nat Gas off 5.53%. It was number four in the other direction last week, up seven and three quarters percent. So giving a good chunk of that back this week. So as you could see, almost the entirety of the light side and one of the dark side is dominated by energy. So I think we have to start there. First, it's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, listeners, to the world of energy we go. You know where you have to go, cmegroup.com slash twifo. Once you're there, go into that drop down. It is an alpha order list. Listeners, you're going to go down three slots to energy. 
And then where we start from there is anyone's guess. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, like I said, we had your buddy, Miss Garner, on the show last week, and she mentioned she was getting PTSD from all the moves and ags, so she had uh, dropped back. We're getting a little bit of whiplash this week in energy. We got light side, we got dark side, we got movers, we got shakers, we got a lot of stuff going on. Where do you want to start in the energy sector this week, sir? Um, heating oil doesn't trade a lot of options, right? It really does not. If you want to go in there, well, we can. Well, then let's go to number two in WTI. I, just, us, I didn't want to. Ta- I didn't want to take you to a uh, to a place where there was. You have been known to take filling. me take me to products that do eight contracts in the past. So yes, I do expect yeah. it from you now. All right, sir. A lot going on in the world of WTI as we're kicking off the show. Uh, threatening the eighty hand. I think it got north of it earlier this week, and then of course a little bit of a sell off uh, yesterday post Fed, but still still looking rocking and rolling up three point. 3% on the week. Of course, you go back to the end of our show last week. It's up about 5.5%. Again, threatening that 80 handle. Starting to see the effects of those production cuts coming out of Russia and Saudi Arabia. Also, some talk out of China about trying to bolster their demand there. So all of that combining for a little bit of a one-two punch. We had a little bit of a downside move again post-Fed. That's to be expected with high rates, but still not enough to curtail the bull this week out there in WTI. Mr. Rhodes, a lot cooking in Atlanta. WTI was catching your eye out there, sir. Uh, Just, you know, bordering on that 80 level. I was looking around for a few option trades that uh, maybe tried to fade that. And we don't see too many of them, but you also don't see... Uh, going back, you just... You don't you, you don't see anybody speculating that it was going to break 80. Uh, so it's one of those cool things you can do with the option market is uh, see where some of the activity is when we're approaching significant levels. Uh, you know, if you if, if you saw some call buying uh, with strikes above 80, you might have thought, hey, it's going to break through there. But didn't quite do that. It, it stuck its head up and got shot down very quickly. So it's just a... a you know, kind of just not a whole lot of call activity uh, when we are testing that resistance level. And and we, we've seen both sides of that since I've been showing up on this program with you, where sometimes we approach a supporter or resistance level and you see an awful lot of option activity uh, that, that would indicate that we're going to keep going in that direction. Uh, you didn't get that feel from the oil option market this past week. And no, now that VIX is getting kind of anemic, outside of today, it looks like uh, we, we killed the market on option block. Listen, we were talking about maybe we might turn red, and then lo and behold, uh, we, are, we are selling off now. So you can blame Henry, our buddy, Mr. Flowmaster, for coming back from vacation and killing the market. While he was gone, <laughs> Mr. Rhodes, the market did nothing but rally. The second he touched his foot on U.S. soil again, market just falling out of bed today. But uh, intriguing stuff. Maybe we'll get there a little bit later. But now that Vol... In the equity space, looking a little bit more anemic, maybe today notwithstanding, catching a little bit of a bid out there today. Have you found yourself looking a little bit farther afield for places for a little bit of volatility, like, say, perhaps the energy sector, Mr. Rhodes? Oh, gosh, absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And also, uh, where I had been looking for volatility, and it's something that I didn't even know we could talk about on this program, um, is those uh, the, the sectors. Yeah, that communication sector oh. future. Have you been trading I, those? I've actually just started doing like relative sector uh, analysis because uh, you see really nice divergences among those, and it's easier to trade them with the futures than the ETP sometimes or the ETF sometimes. So I've been looking at individual sectors. Yeah, I've been looking it, it totally off track with this program, but yeah, you know, we got earnings. So we've had and, and we've had kind of a, a mixed thing there. But, yeah, looking within the commodity space for for something that looks like it's going to break in one direction or another. Um, that's exactly what I was doing. That's exactly why I just made the comments I did about uh, looking at crude because I was looking at crude oil earlier this week. And I was like, is anybody think it's going to break out? You know, maybe we, maybe I should be going counter to the crowd. But um, the crowd doesn't think crowd that that 80 level is tough. It really hasn't been surpassed in almost 10 months. So it's going to probably continue to hold there. But if anything, I guess I'd be fading volatility on WTI after um, a couple of weeks of fun here. A couple of weeks of fun in D. Let's break down this week of fun, listeners. Like we said, a pretty decent week, right around the volume level you would expect, around 433,000 contracts. I expect 440, 450 somewhere around that level by this time of the week, listen. That's pretty much what we're getting out there. So not an explosive week, not over a million contracts, but also not a couple hundred thousand either. In terms of paper, 41% of that going up in the SEP contract has about 21 days to go. So we're going to hang out out there. 
The Vol, 28 and about a quarter off, nearly two points, about a 1.85 points. So coming in a little bit, we were north of 30 on the show last week. Now that's starting to come in a little bit. Still obviously juicy, still roughly 2x what we're seeing out there in VIX land right now. So if you're looking for a little bit of juice, you could do worse than the energy complex right now. When we get to Nat Gas a little bit later, you're going to see a little bit more juice out there. In terms of skew, uh, last week it was all about the puts, 5.6% rich in September. Now this week there's still kind of bid, about 4.5% bid. So again, maybe speaking to what Russell's talking about with some folks not having all the enthusiasm that they're going to be able to break or maintain that 80 level out there. The calls last week, interestingly enough, nobody wanted them. 3.9% cheap. Probably some of that leading into the Fed week. You know, they're higher rates, usually not strong for energy demand. So maybe some of that feeding in. And that's still the case this week, about 4.4% cheap. So the call's getting a little bit cheaper. In terms of action, though, it was the 85 strike calls in September that were leading the dance this week with about 17,300 contracts now, interestingly enough, you're talking about people not thinking this is going to have some legs north of the 80 handle, Mr. Rhodes. seemed like they might have earlier this week because we saw a lot of opening paper earlier in the week, 3,500 on Monday, 2,800 on Tuesday. So opening earlier in the week, and then they kind of bailed later in the week, 4,000 on Wednesday, closing 7,000 today. So it seemed like 85, maybe they were looking a little optimistic earlier in the week, Mr. Rhodes, and then they got the hell out of Dodge. Is that your takeaway as well? Uh, that's if, listen. Listen to how you're explaining it. Absolutely, that's uh, uh, likely what happened. Was we uh, we got close, we failed a bit. We're we're testing it again today, and we're uh, we're kind of failing again today as well. Weirdly enough, folks bailing on the 80s pretty much all week long. Almost 13, almost 14,000 of those trading this week. So they're the number two most active contract. Which again is actually, I take it back. You know what? There were actually some 85s also going up out here in October that were actually pretty active as well, doing nearly 18,000. So actually, I take it back. These are the most active contract of the week. So 85s, looking pretty active. And again, opening earlier in the week, uh, nearly 5,000 on Monday, 2,300 on Tuesday, 6,000 going up on Wednesday, mostly closing 4,800 today. So the same pattern, opening earlier in the week, closing later in the week. If it was reversed, maybe then I might expect this was a little bit of a roll, but it's, it's interesting. Similar flow, similar strike. But doesn't seem like uh, it was it was rolling paper. But uh, we've seen weirder things out there. Back to uh, September now, listeners, and we have the eighty calls. That's kind of what I expected to be lighting up the tape this week. Uh, nearly fourteen thousand of those, and as I was saying earlier, closing almost all week long. So folks bailing on the eighties from the jump. Forty eight hundred on Monday, closing twenty two hundred on Tuesday, closing thirty two hundred on Wednesday, closing thirty four hundred today. So. Interestingly, as we kind of threatened and broke through briefly, that we didn't see maybe more opening early, kind of like we saw the 85s, or opening earlier in the week and then maybe bailing post-Fed. That would have made more sense, but not what we saw out there. And then if you want some put action, we got some for you. It's the September 75 puts going up 11,000 times this week and change. Uh, the big days, Monday and today, both about 38, 3,900 contracts. Obviously, we don't know what's going on today, but Monday was opening. 2,000 on Wednesday and about 1,400 on Tuesday. It's like opening Pretty much all week long, so maybe as the uh, as we headed towards the Fed and coming out of it, folks piling into a few of those puts. That would explain why that put skew is still relatively bid out there. And again, hanging at this 80 strike. Can we maintain it? As Mr. Rhodes alludes to, it has been challenging in the past, so maybe some of that past is prologue feeding in here. If you want a little bit of near data paper, going away tomorrow, listeners, we have the 80 calls those were trading pretty actively all week long, as you might expect, about 8,000 going up, even though almost half of that, 3,700 going up today. So a lot with one day to go. That's interesting. 2,400 yesterday, 1,700 on Tuesday, and a couple hundred on Monday. So opening throughout the week, but the lion's share going up today. So interesting, maybe a little bit of a one day. We just ticked over the 80 handle, 8,001 now. So that's pretty much a binary at this point, listeners. One day to go, 80 calls. We're going to stay north of it. You're going to vote yes or no. Some folks are doing that right now on the 80 calls going away tomorrow. Let's scroll around really quickly. Usually some interesting and or aberrant paper a little bit farther out. How about if we go out to DEES of 2024, listeners? We got a couple of thousand, about 2,500 of the 60 puts going up. 1,100 on Tuesday and the rest like 500 each going up throughout the week. Kind of opening and closing, so weird 
kind of back and forth paper on the 60 puts in des- December of 2024. Uh, we've seen weirder things and also 2,200 of the 72 half puts uh, before you think there's a roll there. There's not. They're just going up uh, different days, 1,100 each a day. So weird stuff afoot there on the downside in D. So you like that? 60 puts by 2024 listeners, uh, December of 2024. Uh, intriguing stuff. Mr. Rhodes, anything else catching your eye in crude oil? Or should we move on to our other frequent offender in the energy complex, which is NetGasser? Well, I saw, I did see a big uh, purchase of the D62 puts as well, which I thought, which kind of goes along with what you just said. But otherwise, let us move forward. All right, listeners, let us move. By the way, if you were intrigued, Mr. Rhodes, you wanted to know about heating oil. I did the math for you. A whopping 1,100 contracts going up this week. So if you want to sink our teeth into 1,100 contracts, I suppose we could do so. Not much to parse, though. I'm fine moving on past that. (laughs) All right, so let's keep rolling to the world of Nat Gas. Listeners, we're going to stay in energy. We're going to pop out of crude oil in the product family, go down two slots to Nat Gas, and we're going to hang out out there. Let's see what kind of week we had from a volume perspective out there. Nat gas, our number one dark side mover off 5.5%. And you know what? A pretty active week, closing in on half a million contracts. Usually we expect similar volume levels to what we're seeing out there in WTI, somewhere around 440, 450. Looking a little bit more robust. Obviously, we've seen it explode north of that, north of a million contracts. Not so much this week, but getting halfway there, about half a million contracts. That is certainly respectable. Uh, Nat Gas, after Carly coming on, talking about her upside a few about a month ago, those worked out pretty well, those SEP threes. Hopefully you got in on that. She actually said on the show last week she thought more of the near-term move would be back to the downside, and that's pretty much what we're seeing back to 260 right now off about a dime in Nat Gas. She also said if you had some of that upside, some of those threes, uh, you should have gotten out of it by then, if not definitely by showtime last week. So hopefully you did because... Not looking as good right now. She wasn't as enthusiastic, though, about loading up on, let's say, a two-half put, which is understandable. It's much more compelling for people to think about a three-call on all the unlimited upside than a two-half put with your very limited downside. doesn't really have the magic to move men's souls at the end of the day, listeners. So 260 right now, off about a dime, nearly 4%. If you go back to the end of the show last week, it's off about 5.5%. Uh, so intriguing stuff. Mr. Rhodes, what's catching your eye out there in the world of Nat Gas this week, sir? Uh, well, a lot of put activity, huh? Um, which is, you know, are, 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 we, are we spread trading oil against Nat Gas right now? Uh, it, just, it, it looks different than, than CL, and I guess it probably should because uh, it's, it's all turning red. But, yeah, you know, that's pretty much it. And it is kind of difficult to, for those of us that are normal option traders to uh, – Get excited about a two dollar and fifty cent strike, regardless of what could happen. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have the magic to stir the soul the way uh, the three call does, right? Still getting some paper out there, closing on half a million contracts in that gas. As Mister Rhodes alluded to, quite a few puts going up. Forty three point six percent of the paper today, nearly half a million contracts going up in the SEP contract that has thirty two days to go. We're going to hang out out there, listeners. And spoiler alert: the first one is a big put. Uh, before we get there, the vol, like we said, going to be a little bit richer than what we just talked about in WTI sub 30. Now we're looking at 55 off about two and a third points. So that's still one of the richest vols we're going to talk about on the show this week by far. But still, it's a, a distant cry from what it used to be when we were threatening triple digits uh, not too long ago out there in good old Nat Gas listeners. So. 55, still robust compared to VIX and a lot of the other products we're going to talk about, but again, coming off quite a bit from its heyday, threatening triple digits not too long ago. Put-wise, or I should say skew-wise, it's all about the puts still. 2.6% bid are the puts. A week ago, this week, 1.8% bid, so coming in a little bit, still a little bit rich. The call is kind of flat last week, kind of flat this week as well. Not a heck of a lot of evolution on the call side, so kind of speaking, I think, to what Carly was saying on the show last week. Not a lot of interest or love for the upside right now. It seems like all the action, such as that is, is to the downside. Uh, that is also held up by the activity we're seeing here. The two and a quarter puts in September are leading the dance by a country mile. 32,566 of those bad boys going up pretty much all week long, opening all week long. So folks piling into those. The big day today, 12,400 today, almost 10,000 yesterday, 6,500 on Tuesday, 4,000 on Monday, opening all week long. So again, just a lot of people piling in to 
those two and a quarter puts, which is one of the reasons why that puts skew still a little bid. Right behind it, though, we do have some call action. Looks like some folks may be taking Carly's advice. The three calls trading in September. Looks like some folks dumped them earlier in the week. So maybe they heard the show. They got the hell out of Dodge. Then there was some opening paper later on the week. So total of 23500 The big day again today. So today a big action-packed day for NAT gas options. 7500 today. 6000 yesterday. 6800 on Tuesday. 3000 on Monday. Only closing on Monday, then opening the rest of the week. You know, looking at the skew, it swung from 0.3% bid to half a percent cheap. So probably some overwriting going on, just given everything we're seeing out there. I have a hard time seeing a ton of people pouring in to buy the SEP 3s right now. But hey, crazier things have happened. And right behind it, how about the two puts? Two and a quarter puts, not out of the money enough for you. Listen, you want to get a little bit farther out of the money? Allow me to present the SEP 2 puts, 23,000 of those. Again, 11,000 today, 8,000 yesterday, 2,200 on Monday, about 2,000 on Tuesday. Again, opening all week long. So folks just piling into those. It's like you might have a bit of a two-half, two-vertical going up today on the put side because 10,600 of the two-half puts traded today. Uh, The total volume for each on the strike for the week is pretty similar. Almost 23,000 of the two puts, about 22,000 of the two-half puts. But today they line up. Almost exactly. The rest of the week, not so much. But interesting stuff out there. Two half puts, two puts, and two and a quarter puts. Kind of leading the dance with the three calls kind of slotting in there as well. Let's look a little bit farther out. Let's go out to the two puts here in November. They did about 15,000 contracts. Almost all of that on Monday. 9,300 on Monday. Mostly opening and then closing the rest of the week. So maybe they scooped some. (laughs) <laughs> and then uh, unloaded them the rest of the week. Uh, either way, uh, interesting paper there. If you go a little bit farther out, we keep talking about these strips, Russell, that have been going up out here every week. I think it was the six calls last for a while there. It was one and three quarters and two and one and a half put strips that were going up. Now they've switched to the call side. And if you look all the way out from looks like pretty much April down all the way to the end of the year, it's the seven calls going up for around 1775 let's see they traded a thousand today 750 on wednesday and 25 on monday (laughs) all opening there uh so uh, interesting stuff i don't know mr rhodes is that you out there gobbling up seven call strips throughout the all of next year in that gas sir my goodness gracious uh i hope that doesn't happen (laughs) <laughs> I just, yeah, that, that, that's one of those, uh, you know, well, we think maybe next spring when the fighting commences again, uh, things will get really ugly over in Europe or something like that. That's a, uh, that, that's targeting, you know, something beyond just natural supply demand boost in the price. Yeah, somebody has this interesting agenda this is, in here. Yeah. In that, they've been doing it every week since the beginning of the year that I can recall, maybe even earlier. It was a lot of puts, but they're doing monthly strips like this. They swung to the calls now, doing a ton of paper every week like clockwork. Uh, it's it's interesting. A little bit maybe indiscriminate. <laughs> they're just taking yeah, off. Yeah, <laughs> and that, that concerns me. And maybe maybe it concerns me a bit because I th- this week in the derivatives class I teach at Kelly – we're talking about uh, being on the wrong side of the market and uh, being on the wrong side of the market when liquidity dries up on you. And this might be an example <laughs> that I use uh, to talk about uh, when we have our little extra session on Saturday. Uh, I might talk about this one as if these guys are wrong on this trade and, uh, you know, and, and as you put it, being very indiscriminate, um, that, you know, they better hope they're right. We'll just we'll put it that way, because uh, we talk about some financial disasters in the past, like the Amerit thing. And then I show how liquidity goes away when you get when you load up on a position and you get caught on the wrong side of the position. Of course, we have no clue. Uh, you know, this guy, what this what this represents relative to uh, anything else that this entity has going on. But it's still a pretty darn big trade for anybody, any size person. Now, speaking of big trades and things maybe uh, not getting it right at first blush, uh, equity markets falling out of bed right now after a nice rally, or they say pretty much have swung a percent from the upside today. We got a question about the communication sector coming into the live chat as well, and we got Dr. Vixon, so I think we got to do a little bit of equities next. 
It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody, pop on out of the energy and then get on into uh, the equity indexes. Usually we hang out in U.S. Index E-mini, and we will do that. If you do want to see it, we have a question coming in here about the different E-mini sectors I was talking about earlier and Russell was talking about. You can find these in the TWIFO report as well. Obviously, no options to speak of, but you can look at some of the action on the futures. The communication sector is all the way down at the bottom. But uh, Mr. Rhodes, who are you and what have you done to the market today? What the hell? I don't know. And, and, and I, I, I despise people that take victory laps. And I was already prepared to do this, even though I was wrong, and now I'm right. Uh, but over the weekend, I pointed out that both VIX and the S&P 500 are trending, we're trending higher together. And I was like, uh, whenever that's happened before, that, that that's it's ended very badly. And this morning, uh, we actually, in, early this morning, VIX broke the previous closing low of this year. And I was like, oh, I'm dead wrong on that thing. And I was still going to talk about it. And I was going to talk about uh, the decisions that you make when you're wrong. And lo and behold, now the whole S&P 500 has flipped around. And uh, it looks like that signal's kind of still holding up. Uh, but what, what I'm talking about is when VIX and the S&P 500, when they trend in the same direction, uh, that typically has happened before some of the bigger events, such as Balmageddon. It happened for about five or six weeks leading up to Balmageddon um, last year, and uh, or not last year, like four or five years ago. And that same, I, I just I saw where uh, VIX had trended higher since it hit a low this year on June twenty second, and it's been trending higher in sync with um, the S and P five hundred trending higher. As of this, you know, this was as of last Friday, and I just tweeted it and tagged Twifo and Option and your your Twitter handle as well, and put that out on Twitter. Uh, but I was going to talk about a chart that that didn't work, and now I'm talking about a chart that looks like it might be working a bit. <laughs> this is one of those days <laughs> we always say, you know, be judicious with this zero day premium you're slinging. Uh, today is a good example. Huge whipsaw out there as well, up half a point over forty six hundred, now down. Uh, 60 handles from that, 4540. My goodness, man. It was just starting to turn on the option block, and we had a Henry on there. He said, it looks like something was coming out of Japan that was starting to, to spook the markets here. You know, we're getting, it used to be like on the floor of the SIBO uh, back in the day. You used to hear the rumble come out of the SPX, and you knew something was happening, no matter where you were on the floor, something was kicking, and then it would spread across the floor. You'd hear that wave. I guess it's now Japan is a new SPX, Russell. Now you hear, the, you hear the rumors and the waves start there, and then it spreads throughout the rest of the market. We had updated the vol for the start of the show. Obviously, kind of throw that out the window. We were at 13 and a half, still down a quarter in VIX when we kicked off the show. Spoiler alert, we are higher now, listeners. VIX is up about a point on the day, about 14.20. So VIX can pop again. I, after the end of the last show, I looked at it. I actually picked up a nice little VIX call fly after all that. I figured we might have a little bit of upside ahead of us. Threw that on, so we'll talk about that more on, on vol views, maybe oddities to more listeners. Looking pretty good so far. VIX at about an 88 now. It was down an 83 when we kicked off option blocks are already popping five points. I'm sure if I re-racked that now, it would be even more. Yeah, 91 again. So getting back almost 10 points from where it was this morning. So the vol of vol getting frothy. Again, these are the moments you got to be judicious, listeners. Just slinging a bunch of zero-day premium like it's going out of style. Day like today, that could come back to bite you. Uh, vol Q was at a 17, pretty much even when we kicked off the show. Let's see where it's hanging out now. 17 and three quarters. So it was down a point. Now it's down, only down about a quarter of a point from the show last week. So, so that puts that VIX, the vol Q spread, at about 3.65. So a little bit wider, about 0.15 wider than it was this time last week. But uh, intriguing stuff. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, you are the once in future and now present Dr. VIX, after all. As we've been watching vol kind of erode, a lot of people, including myself, had kind of some vol erode trade on post-Fed. Uh, I scooped a few puts right after the announcement yesterday. They're looking pretty good for a little while. Obviously, not so much now. What are your thoughts on how Vol has played out in the S&P leading into the Fed and now coming out of it, sir? 
Well, I mean, leading into the Fed, and and I probably, you know, with, with what I wrote over the weekend about VIX holding up and not making a new low while the S&P is making new highs, uh, probably should have had in the back of my mind that this was a Fed week. And I knew that because I wrote about it in the same article. Uh, and I thought about it. It's funny. I published it and I was like, you know, I, I might be wrong just because it's holding up until we get this last Fed announcement. And do we get a volatility dump after that? Uh, I could totally have to totally could have seen that one working out, but uh, somehow it just seems to have reversed for us and, or, you know, or for whatever call I had there. And, you know, volatility uh, is, is, you know, top in 14 right now, but VIX, uh, it, it hadn't, you know, everybody's talking about how freaking low VIX was. And then I, you know, I just, you know, I was like, well, what was the low this year? And just noticed that, uh, you know, VIX is at relatively low levels, but there's a, a slight uptrend there. And that slight uptrend is not something that you would expect. Um, the S&P had made seven new highs for 2023 since the since VIX made the 2023 low. And that divergence never holds up. Uh, it either I guess it either breaks back down, which was this morning what I thought was happening. Uh, and actually, when it looked like that was happening, I turned my I turned my screen off for a couple hours. <laughs> Let it give it give it a couple hours to write itself, and then came back to get on the show with you. And and I'm thanking you and Henry from the bottom of my heart, <laughs> making you look for the like, moment like a genius. We got. We got 53 minutes left. God knows what can happen. <laughs> yeah, this is one of those one of those fun ones, listeners. Got some paper going up out there in the E-mini, as you might expect. 2.8, almost 2.9 million contracts on the tape right now. Sometimes parsing this paper out here, listeners, it's literally like spitting into a hurricane. There's so much going up out here. And again, you have to avoid the noise like the 3840 puts expiring tomorrow going up 50,000 times or the 38 quarter puts expiring in 4 days going up 50,000 times you know if you could dodge the noise finding finding the nuggets listeners it becomes a little bit more challenging and or intriguing like the 45 half puts i would say of the relevant strikes that seems to be one of the more active ones this week these are expiring uh, by the way uh, tomorrow so one day to go listeners 34 almost 35,000 of those trading Pretty much opening all week long. The big day is today, though, 17,400 today. Uh, so if you're piling into some 45 half puts right now, looking pretty good. If you're overwriting those, then uh, look out below. You got one day to go. Uh, they 12,000 yesterday, 4,400 on Tuesday, and about 1,000 on Monday. But again, opening all week long. Right behind it, the 47 half calls expiring tomorrow. My goodness. That seems perhaps a bit of a bridge too far in hindsight. <laughs> 34,000 of those. The big day for those, 14,000. Someone opened 14,000 of those things on Monday. My goodness, 14,000 of the 47 halves expiring tomorrow, listeners. I hope for their sake they overrode those aggressively, aggressively. Uh, 10,000 going up yesterday, mostly closing. So maybe they took a bunch of them off coming out of the Fed, maybe. And then 7,800 today. So the open interest is only 7,000. So it looks like today's paper was all opening. Looks like maybe they opened them on Monday. They bailed on them on Wednesday. And then some folks opening some more today. Eight, who's opening 8,047 halves with a day to go? Actually, looks like it might be a bit of a funky ratio. 46 halves going up 15,000 times today. So it's roughly two to one. So it could be a little bit of fly action, even though the rest of the week that paper, it doesn't line up at all. 10,000 on Tuesday, 5,000 yesterday, 2,500 on Monday. Folks were bailing on the 46 halves pretty much all week long. And then today's paper lines up pretty close to the OI, so they could be bailing again today. Uh, but yeah, weird stuff. 47 halves going up, uh, have a day to go. If we hit 47 half, if even threaten it <laughs> over the span of the next 24 hours, uh, what kind of markets are we living in, listeners? And then let's see. Let's get beyond that really quickly. Let's look a little bit farther out. Let's go to the near-dated stuff that's going out in just a few minutes, 4,600 puts. They traded 24,000 times, almost all of that today, about 20,000 today, 4,000 yesterday, and not much going on the rest of the week. So, folks, if you piled into some 4,600 puts that are expiring in a few minutes, you're looking pretty good right now, listeners. So you obviously listened to the option block, and you said, you know what, this worm is turning. We're getting the hell in there. Also worth noting, the 4,535 puts expiring again in a few minutes. 18,500 of those trading today, total of 20,000 on the week. So 4535. Yeah, so we actually are threatening that level here. So 
Intriguing stuff afoot. Mr. Rowe, is anything catching your eye out here in this tsunami of e-mini paper? No, it looks like uh, some, somebody sold some 47 and a half out of the money call. So maybe they're they're feeling good about that. That's one. what I would hope. I would uh, hope you're not buying. Yeah, those. <laughs> I, I, I've got, for full disclosure, what's going on on the other on the other end of the line right now? Um, I bought myself a Bloomberg and I, I I'm I'm trying to finagle around the Bloomberg as we talk about these markets, and I've never really used it for options on futures. <laughs> so <laughs> if it sounds like I'm a little confused, and, and we know that you know, I was confused for other reasons in the past, uh, I'm still trying to get a handle on uh, looking for block trades. Like you say, you said something looked like it was a, a ratio spread or whatever. I'm like trying to check that, and I can't figure out how to check that. And then um, I should just look at the uh, I should just look at the CME Group Twifo page and and not try to be clever over here. Look at you slinging the Bloomberg terminal, the big bucks over there now for uh, for Bloomberg. So they don't give those away. <laughs> they do not give those away, and uh, yeah, they, not even to college professors. <laughs> yeah, you don't get it. You, hopefully, you get a discounted rate at least, sir. They don't discount anything. <laughs> <laughs> We'll just leave it at that. Don't they know who they're talking to? The once future yeah. and now present Doctor Vix. Uh, you know, intriguing stuff. Speaking of intriguing stuff, we got a question coming into the live chat here from Option God. He wants to know, tell us more about the communication sector, Russell. So he's intrigued by that. He wants to know uh, what you can tell him about it, because obviously you're intrigued by it as well, sir. Well, OK, I, and, and we're going to talk about a little ETFs here and, because that's where these sectors actually emanate from. Uh, the spider folks who do the SPY ETF. They also have 11 industry ones, and I've used those industry ones. I used them in my dissertation. I've used them for all, you know, just tons of different analysis uh, with respect to what's outperforming and what's underperforming. It's just the easiest way to go about doing that. And I was aware that there were sector futures over at CME Group. And I, you know, I've i looked at them every once in a while, but there hadn't been a whole lot of volume. And then I saw the communication sector went on the list today and noticed that the open interest is a little over 4,000. And beyond that, I was kind of impressed that the bid-ask spread was only 15 cents when I checked it a little bit earlier. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to find the the full list of the of, of all of those funds. Uh, but there's an energy one. All of their tickers start with XL. It's like XLE for energy, et cetera. And um, I've, I've just used those for a very long time to get an idea as to what's going on with some sectors versus other sectors. Uh, I've spread traded the, the ETFs against each other when I think it's time for, you know, energy to take a pause and maybe some and, and healthcare is going to do some catching up, et cetera. And, you know, if, if we're starting to see the liquidity in those at CME Group, uh, that's a better short term. In, in my mind, futures are a better short term trading up vehicle than the ETFs, like the micro, uh, e, you know, the micro e mini S and P futures. I, I haven't traded a spider since those things have become available. Uh, I just, you know, they, they, the size is palatable. You can scale up and scale down with those, and you know, having having the same thing. With the uh, you know with the sector the spider sectors uh, I, I might be having a behavior change there where I don't use the ETFs or the options on the ETFs and just use the futures going forward. If so are, that's what I got all excited about. <laughs> if you are curious, listen, you can find these in the Trifo report to see what they are. There's no real options volume yet, but if you're wondering how many there are, there's consumer discretionary, consumer staples, energy sector, financial sector, healthcare, industrial materials, real estate, technology, utilities, and today's star communications. So you have quite a few to choose from. I was just parsing through some of them as uh, Mr. Mr. Once a future Dr. Vix was talking, obviously some of the other ones like energy going to be a little bit more volume heavy. Uh, the OI and energy, 23, 24,000. The volume today, 605. Going out to today's winner, the consumer sector, the OI is only 4,100. The volume today, 20. So as you can see, uh, still a little light, not enough to really get the, the options going out there. But they're growing. They're starting to make it on our list more often. So if you are intrigued by this, uh, options God sounds like you are and anybody else. They are available to look at, at least, and from a volume, you can look at some of the term structure and things in the TWIFO report, and then you can kind of dig into your, your broker's platform or the CME platform, some more info on them. Hopefully, if they keep picking up, then perhaps we shall see 
some options paper out there. Speaking of paper, uh, we did see quite a bit of paper out there in the metals. I think we'll head out there next. Werewolves beware. It's time to explore the options activity in silver, gold, and other shiny things. It's time to talk metals. All right, everybody. Welcome to the shiny stuff. To find it, listeners, pop out of the equity indexes. You're going to go down three slots to metals. Then we're going to hang out in precious for probably the remaining time of the show here, listeners. We have, of course, silver coming at number four off 2.65%. Platinum at number five off 2.05%. Palladium at number three off a little over 4%. A pretty decent banger week for silver. Nearly 50,000 contracts on the tape before you ask about some of the others listeners we have talked about them in the past they don't really do a ton of paper for example palladium right now a whopping 46 contracts and the other p precious name so that five times fast platinum 533 contracts so again not a ton to sink our teeth into there and then of course you want to talk the big dog in the metal sector it is indeed gold coming off a of fed week you expect those to be a kind of a banger actually looking kind of light 169,000 contracts for gold that's not nothing but we've seen it well north of 200,000 in the past around fed week so maybe kind of quiet for gold silver picking up the slack though mr rhodes what's catching your eye in the shiny stuff in the fed week sir uh, it's that 2000 level in gold that's what that's what that, that, that's what gets the people on CNBC's attention, and we can't get past that. Um, We were above it this morning, and now we're below it. (laughs) Uh, And and I'm looking at the December contract. I know um, I... I don't know if that... That's that's what my... That's what my Bloomberg defaulted defaulted to. And right in line, it looks like right in line with the equity markets, it's done the same sort of drop. Am I seeing that correctly? I am seeing that. Yeah, we are selling off earlier today. We are selling off now, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it, it maybe it preceded that drop, <laughs> uh, but it looks like, you know, I see, you know, the 2000 calls being the most active in in the nearest stated one. Uh, I don't know if that's people selling because they think it's not going to get over it or, you know, maybe hopefully some people were able to take some profits as it popped above 2000 and then came right back down uh, over the past couple of days. Or past not even a couple of days. I'm looking at a 24 hour chart. So uh, really, just today, finally, kind of gave up all the gains that it looked like it was putting up. Uh, may, you know, maybe some people thought that the Fed was going to say that inflation is not is is worse than it is or something. I don't I don't know what I don't know what surprise anybody expected out of the Fed <laughs> yesterday. You know, he they... never surprised. He does. You know, I I, I read I, I read a lot about Powell recently, and. He's just he's never going to do anything. He's not throwing any curveballs, man. He's he's going to tell you exactly what they're thinking about doing. He's fully transparent. He doesn't do like Greenspan and confuse the hell out of you. And I think it drives people nuts because uh, you, you don't ever get to prove that you were smarter than the Fed because you can't prove you can't do anything smarter than somebody that's 100 percent transparent with you. You know, I had a student <laughs> ask me, do you think they'll surprise and do 50 basis points? <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> uh, for fodder, Powell, for, for Powell questions like that. Powell is not going to surprise anybody. I guarantee that man has never been able to plan a surprise birthday party in his life. It's kind of a job requirement for the Fed, right, to uh, yeah. not, not surprise yeah, yeah. people, to be as boring to, to, as humanly possible. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what, that's what we get when we don't have an academic economist in charge of the Fed. They actually are straightforward with us and tell us exactly what's going on, which is boring, but not so bad. Ah, academics. We could spend a lot of time. Who would want to talk to an academic? I mean, come on. Nobody. I don't count as an academic. Just the worst. Yeah, you don't. don't. I'm atypical. You moonlight. You moonlight as an academic. I'm clinical, which means I'm I'm, I'm half professional and half academic. Half crazy person. Let's see what's going on out here in the shiny stuff. Even though it's not on our list, listeners. As Mr. Rhodes alluded to, uh, gold and equities are kind of moving in lockstep today. So you know what they say, Mr. Rhodes, when gold and equities move in lockstep, only good things can happen to the market, right? <laughs> only good things in the future for everyone when gold and equities. <laughs> that's a, yeah, there you go. All that, right. That's an old adage, right? I mean, everyone knows yeah. that. It goes back to Dust Bowl days. Everyone, everyone knows that. Uh, gold and equities moving in lockstep. Just get your dancing shoes on. 
<laughs> right now, yeah, gold well south of the uh, 2,000 level. Uh, the big dog in gold this week, listeners, is actually in September, going out 32 days. By the way, I said about 170,000 contracts on the tape, so kind of light. About 38% of that paper going up in September. We're going to hang out out there. What is the vol right now in gold? It was around a 10 handle not too long ago. It rallied a little bit, a little bit north of 11 going into the Fed announcement, coming back off again this week, about a quarter of a point. Still, no one's looking to gold for volatility right now. 10.9 is the set vol. So you think VIX is light? Allow me to present gold vol for you. In terms of skew, it's most of the bid is going to be to the calls. You know the deal in precious metals by now. That was the case last week, 2.7% rich. The calls are kind of flat. Or the puts are kind of flat, I should say. This week, the call is still a little rich, 3.4% bid. The puts... 1.8% cheap. So even though we're selling off, nobody wanted any puts this week, which is kind of interesting. And the big dog this week, listeners, the 2075 calls in September going up nearly 8,000 times. Most of that yesterday, 5,600 times yesterday, 2,000 today, not much the rest of the week. So 2075 calls. Looks like there might be a, maybe a 2,000, 20 half, 2075 it's not quite a fly. It doesn't line up. It's going up. Looks like it's going up maybe one to one today, about 2,500 times or close to it. Uh, yesterday, it went up 2,777 times on the 20 halves, 5,600 times on the 2075s, and 1,200 times on the 2,000. So maybe they were rolling into a 20 half, 2075 ratio. I don't know. The numbers don't make any sense, listeners, but they are lining up 2075s, 20 halves. And 2000s in September were all our most active contracts, 7,800, 6,000, and 5,000, respectively. So that's kind of where all the action is going up in September right now. Behind that, we have the 22 halves. So if you want to kind of split the uprights, get a little bit farther out, those went up 4,720 times today, the 22 halves. That's pretty much all the paper for the week. And there's not much OI there. So that's opening on the 22 halves as well. So weird upside paper going up for a decent size in in September gold, which again, it's gold, so we kind of expect some longer-term upside weirdness, but that one has a unique flavor to it. Allow me to present also, speaking of unique flavors, how about the June 3500s? Uh, they traded 1,100 times this week. <laughs> Looks like it might be a one by 2 there as well. The 27.5, 3500 June one by 2 trading, opening for both legs on Monday. 27.5, 3500 Some of the upside things they do here in gold. They just boggle the mind out here. 21 quarter calls, a lot of calls going up here. Uh, but, and near dated, we have the 2,000 calls expiring in about a day. They traded about 2,400 times this week. Again, that was kind of a psychologically important level this week. Fed week, expect some action there. Uh, 700 on Monday, 700 on Tuesday, 600 yesterday, kind of bailing on some of them. Only a couple of hundred today. Hopefully, some folks got the hell out of Dodge on those before this uh, this move if they were picking them up earlier in the week and since silver is actually on our list let's go out there really quickly as well mr rhodes it's been an intriguing week for or should say intriguing year so far for silver was kind of languishing then it had a pretty aggressive run up there given some of that back this week off about 2.65 percent when you're not paying attention to uh, the big dog gold are you watching a little silver anything catching your eye out there sir Oh yeah, I've I've, I've always enjoyed tra- trading silver because it, sometimes it it kind of lags what's going on with uh, with gold, and uh, you know gold, gold starts to make a move and silver just sits around there, uh, you know, is just sitting around thinking about it. Eventually, it'll start to uh, play some sort of a catch up with it. So I've I have like put on vertical spreads if silver's near support and gold's going in the other direction. Uh, but I've typically done it with the ETFs. I know I'm not supposed to say. I've, t- I've, I've said ETF too many times on this program today. Um, I don't know what those letters so, even mean, sir. What are you talking? Yeah, I, I'm not supposed <laughs> to talk about that. But um, I, so that that's how I have traded silver in the past. It's uh, uh, you know just a matter of if it seems to be lagging gold or the the relationship between the two spreads out too much. Um, because silver is a market that not a lot of people look at. I like to trade. A handful of things that that the crowd's not paying attention to. Uh, so I've, I've, I have done that in the past. I don't have anything right now. And it's been a little while since I did that. I did want to mention, you know, some of the pretty much every call trade that you mentioned with a 2000 handle uh, was a bullish trade. I was kind of going through the block trade monitor <laughs> while you were talking about those different things. The gold bugs and, won't give up. Yeah, the the 2050, the 2050, 2075 uh, September, that was a bull call spread. 
Okay. That was it. They bought the 2050 and sold the 2075. So that was the only one that they you sold. You can't but, stop the gold bugs. Uh, they want it. Yeah. No, it's it's all bullish paper uh, on all of those different uh, – on all the different volume that you pointed out. doesn't necessarily have to be, but it, it is this week. Hey, when it comes to gold, it usually is when you get to that far upside stuff. Uh, intriguing stuff here. And, yeah, we, we joke. We like uh, GLD and SLV here. A lot of people ask their preferred vector for some of these because it's easy. They hold the physical. You don't have all the issues with roll yield that you have with a bunch of other ETFs that try to replicate those. So certainly makes sense why some folks would dip their toes out there. Uh, speaking of dipping, you're dipping into a little bit lower silver this week, 24 and about a quarter in that front future, listeners. How much paper on the tape? About 50,000 contracts, so a pretty decent week out here this week. What's the vol in silver? About 2240 off about a third of a point, so decently frothy double what we're seeing in gold a decent premium over what we're seeing even in equity vol so a little bit of juice to be found out here in silver which makes sense it has been moving a wee bit of late uh let's see skew wise last week in september the calls were 4.2 percent bid and the puts were 1.4 percent cheap this week we have just extended both of those the calls nearly five percent rich the puts two and a half percent cheap so nobody wants the puts everybody's loading up on the calls See how that trade's working out so far. Uh, right now, the 27 calls in September are leading the dance. Once again, September upside leading the dance, kind of like what we saw in gold. 7,600 of these bad boys going up this week. Looks like maybe they wised up on these a little bit, though, because they opened nearly 4,000 of them on Tuesday, and then they closed about 3,000 of them on Wednesday. So maybe they got the hell out of Dodge. They took a flyer heading into, uh, heading into the Fed and got the hell out of Dodge. Either way, 7,600 going up this week, about 1,000 today, not much going up on Monday. Uh, the 28 calls doing 6,000 contracts this week. They were a little bit more evenly spread out. 2,000 on Tuesday, 2,500 on Wednesday, 1,500 today. Looks like opening throughout most of the week there. So uh, intriguing paper there. And right behind it, we have the 26 calls uh, doing about 4,000 contracts. 2,000 on Tuesday, about 1,400 today. The rest kind of scattered throughout the week looks like mostly opening on so a lot of opening paper on tuesday heading into the fed which is kind of to be expected i think and then a lot of other fun stuff unraveling throughout the week all right listeners man an interesting sojourn through the world of futures options this week last week we got ptsd and the ags was pretty much all ags all the time this week, the metals and the equities and, indeed, energy said, don't forget about us. You got actually some whipsaws and some whiplash in both energy and in equities today. Equities, uh, aggressive whiplash action out there. So, Mr. Rhodes, I hope your neck is okay after this uh, very whiplashy episode of Twifo, sir. It, I'm, I'm doing quite fine. I, I have survived. Um, I, I probably... Uh, I, I, you probably wouldn't hear the joy in my voice if if it had been the exact opposite, where we were selling off. I was getting ready to take a victory lap on my little uh, VIX and S&P 500 going in the same direction. And then it reversed on me to the upside. I, I, I you, you probably would have had a hard time getting a word out of me. <laughs> there we go. I'm glad it did not come to pass. I, I, I got to I gotta emotionally sep- separate myself from all this. <laughs> all right, Mr. Rhodes. If folks want to check out what you got cooking throughout the week, maybe give you some stuff to work on to put that Bloomberg to work. Oh, yeah. Where yeah, should they I'm go? What totally, should they do? I'm totally wide open on that one. Uh, the best place is, is I have a Substack. It's russellroads.substack.com, and I just write things up every weekend. And during the week when things are going on, I, I might throw something out there. I've been uh, throwing some things out with, with all the earnings that have been going on. Uh, but I'm also expanding uh, what I cover to a few more macro markets as the summer goes along. So I'm going beyond just S&P, VIX and stocks. It's it, it, commodities are getting uh, commodities and options on commodities are starting to be part of my repertoire on the Substack. There you go. You got to pay for that Bloomberg somehow, sir. I so. do, or at least m- at least make it worthwhile. So. <laughs> there you go, listeners. Follow him on Twitter at Russell Rhodes, all one word. Check out his Substack as well. Send him your queries. Give him stuff to research on his brand spanking new Bloomberg terminal over there. And of course, you know where to go. Check out these reports and a whole bunch more. SeeMeGroup.com. You can begin your journey at slash Twifo. Where you go from there, it's up to you. But intriguing stuff. Back, speaking of intriguing stuff, I had a good chat uh, the other day with uh, Mr. Nick Howard, the creator of all these 
reports over there. You check them out, bantix.com, B-A-N-T-I-X.com, if you want to go get the premium version of Twifo. But they are cooking up some really cool stuff, not just limited to futures options anymore. So if you've been saying to yourself, man, I'd love to see some of these tools expand to other markets, you might be in luck. So intriguing stuff coming down the pike from those folks as well. Unfortunately, no more intriguing stuff coming from us today. That is going to do it for us on the network today. Back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern on Volatility Views. We'll be joined by Mr. Scott Nations there. Then after that, for all you pro folks, coming back with Options Oddities. Got some trades to talk about this week, so it should be kind of fun. If you want to check out that show, if you don't want your broadcast week to end with Volatility Views, only one place to go, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro to learn more. Then we're back again next week, all the way to next Thursday, another episode of This Week in Futures Options. Stay safe out there, everybody. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options. StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.